Thank you for joining the Library Leadership and Management Association New Professional LIS Outreach Team. I am Presiding Chair Elise Jordan. We are pleased to have Dr. Nicole Cook today to discuss when anti-racist reading lists aren't enough. Following up on her column in Publishers Weekly, Dr. Cook will reiterate her assertion that reading popular books is not enough to become an anti-racist. Dr. Cook will show us concrete steps to engage in her critical self-reflection, to develop critical consciousness, and to focus on action and advocacy. She will share her thoughts and strategies on how to progress along this path towards substantive and sustainable personal change that will in turn change society. Dr. Cook is the Augusta Baker Endowment Chair and Associate Professor at the University of South Carolina. Her research and teaching interests include human information behavior and critical culture information studies, diversity, social justice, and librarianship. She was the 2019 Elise Excellence in Teaching Award recipient and she has authored several books, including Information Services to Diverse Populations and Fake News, Alternative Facts and Information Literacy in a Post-Truth Era. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Cook. I am the Augusta Baker Endowed Chair at the University of South Carolina. Thank you for joining me for this session on When Anti-Racist Reading Lists Aren't Enough. Before we get started, I just want to give a very quick introduction to Augusta Baker. Augusta Baker was a legendary Black librarian, author, educator, and storyteller extraordinaire. And in addition to having the honor of being in a position named after her, I think it's appropriate to give her as an example for what we're going to talk about today. Augusta Baker was the author of one of the first bibliographies to give resources, particularly children's books, that represented African American children in a positive light. In her role as a children's librarian at the New York Public Library, she was privy to a lot of resources and books that portray children in a very negative light. And as the anti-racist advocate that she was, she decided that she needed to do something. She decided that she needed to take action. And her bibliographies were in part uh, the action that she took to change the face of children's publishing. And her bibliographies and her teaching and her work had a profound effect uh, on the children's publishing industry. So now in 2020, we have We Need Diverse Books, we have Disrupt Texts, we have a variety of different initiatives that talk about the, the continued need to diversify our children's literature. And she was certainly one of the forerunners in that area. So let's get started. So what you have on the screen here are two things. On the left-hand side, you have a website that I created entitled Anti-Racism Resources for All Ages. And on the right-hand side, there is a screenshot of a column that I had the opportunity to write for Publishers Weekly Magazine entitled, Reading is Only a Step on the Path to Anti-Racism. And in that column, I talked about three things, or three steps, if you will, about how we might work towards becoming anti-racist. And that's what we'll be talking about in our time together today. Before I get into those three steps, I just want to give you a brief origin story about the anti-racism site. This site came about very shortly after the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis in May of 2020. And like a lot of people, I was at loose ends. Uh, I was grieving, I was mourning, I was confused and at loose ends about the racism and violence that was happening in our country and about the needless death of George Floyd at the hands of the police. 
And I started getting messages from different people saying, can you recommend a book or can you recommend a resource because I don't know how to explain this child or I'm having a hard time understanding uh, what all is happening in the world. Can you recommend something? And I didn't necessarily have the bandwidth to serve as a personal librarian or uh, provide readers advisory to a lot of people who were all trying to figure out what was happening in the midst of nationwide, actually global, protests over George Floyd's death. So this site came about uh, as a way for me to process uh, my own feelings, my own uh, confusion about what was happening. And also it was a way to reach out or, or reach back, I should say, to the people who were asking me for resources um, and they could look on this site and you know, find something uh, that they could read or perhaps that they could read to their children. So that is the brief origin uh, of this particular site. One thing to mention, um, we seem to be at an age of reading lists. Uh, there is no shortage of reading lists or things to read, uh, particularly around how to become anti-racist. So of the almost 180 resources on this site, and there are some videos, there are lots of book lists, things of that nature. All of these things came through my social media feeds. That gives you an idea of just how much has uh, been pushed out uh, in terms of anti-racism. And on one hand, that's a great thing that there is no shortage of information that people can use to sort through their own personal journey. But on the other hand, um, when you have too much information, it can become overwhelming. And then it could actually lose the initial power that it has. So when I was writing the column, I was talking uh, to the audience and really saying that, you know, all of these different book lists and reading lists and book clubs uh, and videos and short courses and webinars and MOOCs and everything that was coming out, they're all wonderful, right? Um, but if you leave it there, if you don't take your new learning and understanding a step farther, you're really not um, taking full advantage of becoming anti-racist. You're not really uh, completing the process, right? Reading is only the first step, um, as the title of the column says. Once you read and once you understand what is being uh, written, right? Because we have so many different things that are coming from different perspectives. You can't just read one thing, right? But say you have uh, a small list of books uh, that you're reading, then what? What do you do with that information that you have now acquired? And in the column, I suggest that we all have to go through a couple of steps. And this doesn't have to be an all-inclusive list, right? Think of these as uh, broad steps broad suggestions uh, that you can customize to your own learning, uh, to your own situation. But I suggested that once you read what's on some of these lists, you engage in a process of critical self-reflection. And then after critical self-reflection, you should work towards building and developing your own critical consciousness. And then after that, take action. As I mentioned, uh, that Augusta Baker took action in some of her work. Okay, so let's walk through uh, some of these steps. So the first step after you've uh, read uh, books by Ibram X. Kendi or Robin DiAngelo or any of the wonderful books that are out, uh, specifically talking about race and anti-racism, you need to engage in critical self-reflection. And by what, what I mean by that is that you have to go through your own process of getting to know yourself. And you have to know yourself before you can get to know others and engage with them on these topics. So this idea of critical self-reflection is fluid. 
it's ongoing, right? So it's not something that you say, I'm gonna spend an hour today and I'm gonna critically self-reflect and I'm gonna be all done. This is an ongoing process, dynamic process, because we as human beings are dynamic entities, right? So when we're thinking about critical self-reflection, it is a process of vulnerability on our part. And it is also a process of being humble having some humility and having the wherewithal to know that you have something still to learn. None of us know everything. We all have room to grow and change. And so thinking about what are my own implicit biases? What level of prejudice do I have towards one group or another, right? So this is not necessarily a, a painless process, right? It might be an uncomfortable process if you are thinking about uh, yourself and, and what baggage, if you will, uh, if what things you are bringing to the table. We all have biases. We all have prejudice. And we have to acknowledge that. And we have to say, I acknowledge this. I acknowledge these areas. I acknowledge that I have room to grow and change and develop. And, and the first step, right? So you've taken the content from uh, how to be anti-racist or white fragility, uh, and you can see where different parts of these books and different parts of the content actually hit home right? They actually relate uh, to some part of yourself. And so that's part of that critical self-reflection process. And I myself, as particularly as an educator, uh, go through a critical self-reflection process on a regular basis, right? Um, I have the honor and privilege of teaching several courses related to equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice. And if I'm going to be the best educator that I can be, that means that I have to take that risk. I have to be vulnerable and have some intellectual humility myself uh, if I'm going to expect that from my students. So I critically self-reflect uh, as, as much as I can, uh, thinking about um, what materials uh, to use and how to best explain some of these topics, and also to think about who I am as a person, right? Because who I am as a person very much influences who I am as an instructor, as an educator, et cetera. Okay, so that's a little bit about the critical self-reflection process. And this can come in many forms, right? Um, certainly, you can reflect individually, quietly. Uh, you could reflect by having conversation with a trusted friend or family member. You could journal. Uh, you could create uh, art or music or something of that nature. Um, so there is no one way. Uh, to do this. Uh, obviously, you will find the best way that works for you, um, but it is a matter of absorbing this new information, information that challenges you, information that might point out to you that, no, you're not uh, the ally that you thought you were, or no, you're, you don't have the best understanding of race and racism and oppression as you thought you did, right? So it's absorbing that new information, figuring out where your gaps are, figuring out where your strengths are, and using that information to grow and change in a positive way. So that would be uh, just a little bit on critical self-reflection. So from the column, when I talk about critical self-reflection, I mentioned strive to become culturally confident, work to become comfortable with being uncomfortable with your various privileges, including white privilege and implicit biases. Make a concerted effort to be a better listener and believe the marginalized when they alerted to abuse, microaggressions, and other mistreatment. Right, so this is part of the process. And we'll talk about a few of these things coming up. Um, but I do want to just point out this idea again of becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable, 
right? It's easy for us to feel discomfort and say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Um, but I encourage you to push through that. Um, I also want to point out this idea of listening. Active listening is a skill. And that is one of the things that we need to build up uh, in ourselves if we're going to really uh, effectively participate in equity work. We have to listen to others. And it's not listening to respond, it's listening to understand. And it's listening uh, to hard things. It's listening to experiences that other people have that you've never had and perhaps it never occurred to you you know and instead of you know kind of that knee-jerk reaction of saying oh no that didn't happen oh that couldn't have been that bad no that's not what active listening is the active listening is tell me more the active listening which also leads into action is saying how can i help one of the other dimensions of critical self-reflection. And also it kind of bridges that gap between critical self-reflection and critical consciousness is becoming culturally competent. And we could have whole day sessions, we could have whole conferences talking about cultural competence and how you become culturally competent and how you stay culturally competent. Because again, Cultural competence is an ongoing dynamic process. This is something that you will do uh, for the rest of your life if you are doing it effectively. So in a nutshell, cultural competence is much more than cultural awareness, right? So with cultural competence, we want to become aware of people who are different from us, uh, aware of groups that are different from us, uh, who have different religions, different sexual orientations, uh, different belief structures, uh, you name it, um, any, anyone or any group that is different from you. And moving past the awareness, we need to get to the point where we actually celebrate the differences of others. We realize that everyone has so much rich history and culture and everyone is bringing something wonderful to the table. And when we put all those things together, we all benefit, right? So that is really cultural, cult, excuse me, cultural competence in a nutshell, right? And so you can see here on the screen that it's presented as a continuum. Uh, in some of my writing and research, I like to portray it as a cycle. All right, think of a circle, right? It, just because the circle gives some fluidity to it, and it also uh, gives motion to this process of cultural competence. With one group that's different from you, you could be culturally competent. Um, another group, um, yet another group that's different from you, maybe you're at cultural pre-competence, right? Hope that uh, really no one is at cultural destructiveness uh, in incapacity. But, you know, with uh, the world as it is, uh, we see quite a few examples of cultural destructiveness. But to say uh, that you have different levels of cultural competence for the various groups or various people that you interact with. Now, before I move on from cultural competence, um, and again, cultural competence as a dimension of your critical self-reflection process, I do wanna mention cultural blindness, which is the yellow column on the screen here. Cultural blindness is in effect I don't see color or color blindness, right? And on paper, I don't see color uh, could be presented as a positive thing in that, you know, someone might say, I don't want to treat anyone differently. I want to treat everyone the same. But really, you have to see people's difference, right? Uh, if you don't see people's difference, you are denying the identities and the, the differences uh, of other people that make that they are, right? So instead of saying, I don't see the differences, of course you see them, 
but you have to get to the point where you are celebrating them and looking at these differences as assets and not deficits. All right, so I just want to be uh, mindful uh, because we hear a lot about color blindness and I don't see color. Um, and that really is a dangerous uh, space to be in. And so that's something uh, that we also deal with in the critical self-reflection process, moving away from color blindness and I don't see color. Another part of the critical self-reflection process is intersectionality. And I know that intersectionality is a buzzword and that, you know, lots of people have heard it. Um, and I just want to point out um, intersectionality, which was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw uh, about maybe about 30 years ago. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is a legal scholar and intersectionality emerged out of her work as a lawyer. And she was presenting a case um, about a black woman who was suing an auto company. Uh, she was a factory worker uh, putting together cars. She was on an assembly line. And the woman eventually had to sue the automaker uh, for discrimination. And so not only was she alleging that the company discriminated against her because she was a woman, she was saying that the company discriminated against her because she was African-American. So when Kimberly Crenshaw was talking about inter intersectionality, she was suggesting that this black woman had a different experience than the white women that worked in this auto factory. This black woman also had a different experience than the black men that were working in this factory. And so this is not to say that the black woman's experience was better or worse than anyone else. It's just different. Think about intersectionality as interlocking oppressions, right? So you have a certain amount, or I shouldn't say a certain amount, you have a particular form of oppression uh, that is uh, put on you as a woman. You have a particular oppression that is forced upon you as an African-American. So you have these two op oppressions interlocking, right? And that's going to be different than what a white woman or a black man experiences. So I wanted to give you kind of the origin story of intersectionality um, and also suggest that as part of the critical reflection process, we are thinking about who we are as individuals, right? So again, uh, remember I said earlier, we can't really know other people and engage with other people until we know ourselves. So if I'm thinking about myself as an African-American woman who has a PhD, uh, who is heterosexual, who is Christian, and who is able-bodied, right? Those are some of my primary identities. Some of those identities uh, come to me as interlocking oppressions, right? Again, uh, perhaps uh, female and uh, African-American, right? Um, other of my identities give me great privilege, right? So for example, in the world of higher education, my PhD affords me a great deal of privilege. Now I will say and admit that we all have these privileges and we all have these disadvantages that come with our various identities and they can change according to place and time. Right, so I mentioned uh, that my PhD affords me a great deal of privilege on campus. My PhD affords me no privilege <laughs> when I'm off campus, right? Um, in fact, when I'm off campus, then I deal sometimes with the disadvantage of my African-American identity because people are then judging me according to my appearance, right? You can't look at me and tell that I have a PhD, right? So then we're talking about visible and invisible uh, disadvantages and privileges. So again, the word fluidity, right? All of these change. So we have to really be cognizant um, and, and be clear 
deeper about our different identities, where we have points of privilege and where we have points of dis disadvantage. Everyone has points of disadvantage and everyone has some form of privilege. Uh, whether it's consistent, whether it's every day, um, but we still all do have points of privilege. And so if we can figure that out about ourselves, uh, hopefully it will help us engage with others who are different. And we realize that other people are coming to the table with privileges and advantages. The last part that I want to mention to you in terms of this critical self-reflection process, and it's very much related uh, to becoming culturally competent and recognizing your own intersectionality, recognizing the intersection, intersectionality of others, is this idea of empathy, right? And so how do we recognize the disadvantages of others? Right, it's, it's hard to kind of put yourself in other people's shoes uh, when you don't have to deal with what they deal with, right? But can you understand where they're coming from? Or at least can you attempt to understand where they're coming from? Just as you would want other people to try and understand what you're going through. So again, think back to what I said about active listening. This is not about, uh, saying to someone, no, that didn't happen. No, it couldn't have been that bad. It's more about how can I help? What can I do, right? This is how we make attempts to be empathetic with other people. And just like everything else, uh, developing empathy uh, is a skill. Uh, developing empathy uh, is like developing a, a muscle, right? We don't want to have that knee-jerk reaction to try and fix things for people. Um, sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes it's just about being there and trying to see things from other people's perspectives. Now, I'm not gonna show it to you here, but I do want to highly recommend uh, this very short clip on empathy by Dr. Brene Brown. You've probably heard of Brene Brown. Uh, she does a lot of work uh, in the area of vulnerability and, and talking about a lot of what we're talking about today in terms of how do we become more empathetic? How do we increase the success of our interactions with people who are different from us? And in this clip, uh, she talks about the difference between sympathy and empathy. They are two very different things. So sympathy is, oh, I feel really sorry for that person because they have this disadvantage and it really, they had a bad experience as a result, right? That's sympathy. Sympathy is fleeting. She is suggesting that we get to empathy, um, as I just mentioned to you. Empathy is long-term. Empathy is sustaining. Empathy is really about making connections with other people. So I would really recommend taking a look uh, at this clip. So let's talk about critical consciousness now. All right, so think about this as a uh, level two or maybe step two, uh, if you will. So after you've read uh, Ibram X. Kendi and Robin D'Angelo and some other folks, you've absorbed new content and you've had time to do that critical self-reflection. What we find in some of these texts and some of these experiences from other people is I don't know the entire story. And what I mean by that is you're going to be reading about structural racism and you're going to be reading about institutional racism and racism as it impacts organizations and society. Right, so there'll be examples that you read about and hear about about how racism impacts individuals, right? And we certainly want to acknowledge that uh, and work against that. Um, but there are also societal ills that we need to have a better understanding of. So, for example, redlining, right? There, there are entire neighborhoods and areas uh, where people of color were 
actually not allowed to purchase homes or live, right? So that was part of segregation. But there is a lot of detail that goes uh, into the discrimination that is redlining. Uh, another example would be uh, health disparities. Uh, for example, African-American women have a much higher mortality rate when it comes to having children than other groups. Why is that? There's a lot of literature about how doctors think that African-Americans have higher pain tolerance and therefore they're not given drugs to uh, alleviate their pain, right? So there's a lot of implicit bias. There's a lot of other things that affect um, our actual institutions. And I mean physical institutions and I mean uh, disciplines like medicine uh, and, and real estate and things of that nature. And so on the uh, website that I created, uh, there are lots of books that will help us get into this critical consciousness of really trying to figure out and really understand the structural barriers uh, that create everyday racism. Okay, so, and, and with this critical consciousness, um, it really gets into this idea of we can't address um, or help alleviate things that we don't see or understand. Right. So if we don't know about housing barriers, we can't really uh, help alleviate them. We can't um, help eliminate hunger and food insecurity if we don't understand uh, the racism in farming. If we don't under if we don't hear some of the stories about how black farmers were given radioactive seeds that were designed to eliminate their crops. Right, so we have to understand the, the think of them maybe even as tentacles, right, if you will, um, about all of the different uh, impacts that affect, you know, um, our everyday, right. So if you, if we can't understand uh, and see the ailments, uh, we can't work uh, to correct them. So again, from the column, uh, thinking of critical consciousness, I wrote, with your new awareness and understanding, learn about the systemic inequities that continue to plague our society. Things like redlining, medical apartheid, classism, whiteness, coded language, and many other inequities continue to have a stronghold on how people are socialized and leave, excuse me, lead their lives. In order to become anti-racist, we first have to do the work of recognizing internalized racism and white supremacy that beget racist thoughts and behavior. As author activist Ali Henney says, saying you're sorry only puts a band-aid on the cut. You need to examine how you picked up the sword in the first place. So two authors that I really want to put forth at this level uh, when we're trying to develop a critical consciousness are Bell Hooks and Paulo Fiere. Bell Hooks uh, has written many wonderful books. Um, the one that I want to point out here is Teaching to Transgress, Education as the Practice of Freedom. And so for those uh, listening uh, and watching this are uh, who are classroom teachers, for those uh, who are librarians and information specialists, you are you are educators as well. Um, but even if you're you're neither a, a teacher or a librarian, just in your everyday interactions with people, I think Bell Hooks, her work is applicable. One of the things that she talks about uh, in this particular text is the idea of engaged pedagogy. She says, educate as the practice of freedom is a way of teaching that anyone can learn. She talks about teaching as a way of transgressing boundaries, of transcending those differences that we might ordinarily think uh, divide us. 
And she talks about how to deal with change and antagonism in our, in our life, in our world, right? We all have problems. We all, again, have those points of privilege and disadvantage. Um, but she feels like education is one of the uh, great equalizers and one of the ways that we can transcend difference to come together uh, and to be able to work together. Bell Hooks uh, is very, has very much been influenced by Paulo Fiere. Fiere is, well, excuse me, was a Brazilian educator um, who also talked about uh, education as a way to liberate us, as a way to bring us together. And so he talked very much about not having the banking method of education. And think of the banking method as, you know, you're sitting in a classroom and the teacher is lecturing to you um, and you're just supposed to pick up all of the information and facts. And that would be the banking method. Instead, he and Hooks are very much in favor of the co-construction of knowledge, right? So the people who are considered the students or the learners bring as much value and as much experience to the table as the teacher does. And how does the teacher work with the students to create new knowledge? Right. So again, uh, moving past those differences and focusing on our similarities, focusing on how our different experiences uh, can merge together to create something bigger. So Fiere says uh, that we need to be aware of our shortcomings, and that is one of the ways that we can become more fully human. One of the key points to both Hooks and Fiere is this idea of dialogue and how we uh, talk and interact with one another to create greater things. And dialogue is essentially a form of dialogic action. And dialogic action, um, again, uh, obviously we're talking to one, of, one another, but we're also cooperating with one another. We're also trying to find unity with each other. Um, and we're trying to synthesize each other's differences in culture to create something greater. So Friere says that this is all a horizontal relationship. So not the hierarchical teacher-student relationship, but a horizontal relationship between humans that incorporate love, humility, faith, hope, and critical thinking. So I hope that this gives you a sense of how to start working towards some of this uh, critical consciousness. Now, before we move to uh, level three or step three, if you will, which is action and advocacy, um, I did actually want to stick in uh, a step 2.5, and I'm calling this preparing for action, right? Because we get all of these ideas and these theories and they're wonderful and they really uh, give us a foundation and a new understanding, but they don't always give us the practical, right? So for example, you know, we could read about microaggressions uh, for days, but the next time you witness or hear a microaggression, you might freeze and think, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to address this, right? Perfectly normal, perfectly natural. Uh, and doing this equity work, doing this social dust work, again, is a skill. It's something that we develop and something that we have to work to maintain. But with that in mind, uh, there are also any number of really great books uh, that will address the practical. Right. These are the texts that assume that you have read Hooks and Friere and Kendi and D'Angelo and, and you have a really good understanding. And now these are the books that you're going to read uh, that are hopefully going to give you some practical steps. Right. And are going to help you perhaps even figure out what to say and how to say it. Uh, it's going to help you figure out how to have these really hard conversations. Uh, with the people in your life, whether at your uh, workplace or in your home, 
um, how to think about including people in conversations, how to talk about race and oppression and white privilege and all of these things that can be really hard and painful things to talk about. So I'll just give you a few recommendations. These are ones that I really uh, found helpful and ones that I use in my classroom. Uh, the one on the far left is Gerald Wing Sue, Race Talk in the Conspiracy of Silence. Dr. Sue has done extensive work uh, in microaggressions um, in his worth, excuse me, his work is really worthwhile in helping us understand and helping us deal practically uh, with the microaggressions and uh, frankly macroaggressions uh, that we may experience or witness in our everyday lives. The next book is On Being Included by Sarah Ahmed. And uh, Sarah's book is really helpful because it gives us some language to identify some of the things that uh, we see. Uh, and it also gives us a way of pointing out uh, some of the deficiencies in the current movement of diversity training, right? We've all had some type of diversity training at this point, but is are these trainings really beneficial? Are they really long lasting? Are they really effective? And on being included uh, gives us some ways to um, identify what we're seeing and perhaps uh, change things around. The next two books, Inclusive Conversations, and We Can't Talk About That at Work, are both by Mary Frances Winters. Uh, and uh, additional, uh, really useful sources about how to have the actual con hard conversations uh, with people around us, right? So, you know, you probably can't see the, the fine print on the book covers, but you know, there are certain things we are socialized and, and taught that we can't talk about in, in public, like race, religion, money, um, other things. So Winters is really trying to debunk some of that and give us those strategies and techniques to have these conversations that will hopefully uh, move us to higher levels uh, with those that we deal with. So now let's talk finally about level three or step three, which would be action and advocacy. Okay, so you've done the reading, you've done the self-reflection, you've probably done a little bit more reading and a little bit more self-reflection in this uh, quest to uh, gain some type of critical consciousness. Now you have to put all of this new understanding into action. Right, and you know, we unfortunately uh, lost the powerful, wonderful John Lewis recently, uh, who is really a living example of taking action. And so, you know, we see different examples of nonviolent action. Uh, we have unfortunately seen uh, uprisings um, that are not so nonviolent, um, but you know, there are lots of ways to take action. Um, that is one thing, uh, another thing I would like to put forth is that there are many ways to take action. Uh, you can donate to a cause. Uh, you could write to your representatives. You can physically protest. You can do volunteer work. Um, so I don't want anyone to think that, you know, I can't take action because I don't know how or I'm not comfortable doing X, Y, and Z that's fine. You don't have to do what everyone else is doing. You find a way uh, to take action that is comfortable for you and that will hopefully make the change that you're after, right? So when we're talking about action and advocacy, I'm going to give you a couple of other um, avenues and resources that could even help you further think about the type of action you might want to take and help you to speak up. Uh, there is an organization called Holla Back, and I will uh, provide links to all of these. They provide amazing online trainings on essentially how to speak up, right? How do you disrupt those microaggressions that you see? How do you step in and help someone who's being harassed? Um, online or in person, right? Um, we have 
also been uh, in a period with the coronavirus where there has been an amazing uptick uh, in hate crimes against Asian Americans and uh, folks of Asian descent, right? It's It's been remarkable in the worst possible way to see how people have been uh, discriminated against and physically attacked uh, solely on their appearance, right? So one of their trainings is how to uh, step in when you see the type of harassment. Another resource is mental health first aid. And that is a class that you can look up and take. Um, how do you step in and make change when someone might be having a crisis or someone is exhibiting uh, signs of a breakdown or depression or something of that nature? Another organization is Race Forward, and they do a lot of wonderful training about racial equity uh, and how to incorporate that uh, into your personal lives and also into your community uh, life and community uh, activism. So when we're talking about action and advocacy, um, we're talking about speaking up. We're talking about giving up our own power and privilege uh, to help others, right? So again, we all have power and privilege. It could be in different places um, and in different environments at different times, but we all have it. How do we use our power and privilege to assist others, to help others? And we're talking about long-term, right? Uh, to help make uh, life in society better for others who perhaps have more disadvantages. So, you know, we've all heard the cliche, uh, you know, having a seat at the table. Action and advocacy includes us making room at the table for others, or perhaps even giving up our seat at the table. And this is about going out of our own way to make things better for others, even when it's inconvenient for us. That is, part and parcel of action and advocacy. So just like everything else we've talked about, action and advocacy is an ongoing process. Uh, maybe you're not acting every single day, um, but maybe you are uh, volunteering or maybe you're teaching a class or maybe you're just, you know, being an advocate and an ally in your workplace for one of your patrons or a coworker, right? So, you know, and fluidity, right? Coming back to that word about how uh, we can best uh, aid others and 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 come uh, to the defense of others, and, and really just how do we make the world a better place for all of us, right? Again, sounds a little cliche, but. That's really uh, what this is about. So again, from the column, uh, under the section for action and advocacy, I wrote, anti-racism is about action and enacting your critical consciousness. This is the part where you engage in tangible, community-based actions. This is where you create a plan to become a better citizen and ally. This is the part where you help change the world. And finally, as a personal plea, um, thinking about the outpouring of anti-racist reading lists and book clubs and things that have emerged and re-emerged as a result of the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, um, and things that have really come to the forefront in the spring of 2020. But these will pass um, from our minds, from the forefront of our minds. The news cycle will, will turn to something else. Um, and, the, and the book clubs will stop. Um, you will perhaps have read a couple of books and, you know, I don't know what else to do. I have something else pressing that's taking my attention. Please use your voices and power to amplify the voices of those who would not ordinarily have the opportunity to share their perspectives. Don't let your passion die when the current anti-racism book club trend begins to fade. 
we're all in this together. And anti-racism can only succeed and be sustainable when it's a collective effort. So this is not to say that we don't take breaks or that we don't get tired and, and need to regroup and refresh. Um, but to say that the next person we see killed on film or the next person that is killed uh, because of some type of injustice, we should not have to start all over. We should not have to start from square one um, and have to read uh, and gain uh, critical consciousness and redevelop um, cultural competence and reanalyze our own intersectionality. We should be building ourselves up so we can be prepared to take action and advocacy the next time there's something uh, that we see requires an equity lens, uh, that requires a social justice lens. So this is about uh, building up and maintaining that foundation, because unfortunately, we're always going to have some type of inequity or injustice uh, that needs our help. So finally, and I thank you for hanging, hanging with me uh, this long, a couple of things to read. Uh, these are the things that I mentioned uh, thus far in the presentation. Hooks, Friere, uh, the books by Ahmad, Dr. Sue, uh, and Mary Frances Winter, right? And the other thing I would add, I would also suggest an article that I wrote um, that really gives you a sense of the type of critical self-reflection that I have engaged in uh, and hopefully uh, was able to convey to you in our time together. And at the bottom, we have action and advocacy. No more reading. We need you to actually do something. So with that in mind, I thank you so very much uh, for joining me uh, for this webinar uh, when anti-racism book lists are not enough. Um, I hope that I was able to give you something to think about and hopefully able to uh, give you a plan of action and give you some resources to help you uh, level up, if you will, um, into this uh, development of critical consciousness. And hopefully all of this will give you uh, some confidence in your ability uh, to take action and advocacy uh, and to become part of that collective uh, that really can uh, help us all change the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Cook. And let's continue this conversation on Thursday, August 20th, 2020 at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook Live. This is an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask Dr. Cook questions about when reading lists aren't enough. Join us at the University of South Carolina iSchool by entering the URL or scanning the QR code. How do you ask questions? You may submit questions by entering the URL or scanning the QR code in advance. We look forward to seeing you on August 20th, 2020 at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the University of South Carolina iSchool Facebook page. <laughs>